Uh, you're all very welcome along to this event as part of the Dublin Festival of History. This is a big year for the Dublin Festival of History. It is its 10th year uh, and there have been more than 130 events taking place right across the city and county. And that programme is both online uh, and in person in, in libraries and cultural institutions uh, across the city of Dublin. Uh, we're approaching a major anniversary for History Ireland magazine. This festival is all about public history. And it's fair to say that Tommy Graham, editor of History Ireland magazine, is undoubtedly one of Ireland's most prominent public historians. Uh, the journey of History Ireland, I suppose from its humble beginnings to what it is today, a multi-platform uh, format, hedge schools, in-person talks, magazine, digital content, uh, is the subject of our discussion today. So you're all very welcome along, and it would be great to hear from uh, readers of the magazine in the chat box, any questions that you have uh, for Tommy about the, the present or the past of History Ireland magazine. Uh, Tommy, a good logical place to start this discussion, I suppose, before we get into History Ireland uh, itself, it would be nice to hear how you ended up there, your own journey to history. You know, for every historian, I think the central inspirations and in what brings them to history uh, are different, but what was it for you? Well, it was a, it was a kind of a long and winding road, Don, I have to say. Um, I'm, I'm from Ballyshannon originally, Donegal. My father worked for the, in the ESB, but my parents were, were involved in the Donegal Historical Society, you know, just as ordinary members, you know. And of course, that's still going strong, one, one of the, the, the most prominent uh, kind of county historical societies in the country. But I remember as a child being brought on field trips, there was a, there was a, a fa father, Paddy Gallagher, I, I had no idea what happened to him, but I presume he's long dead. But he was one of these very charismatic, you know, uh, people who, who just just by the, his sheer enthusiasm would bring you know stuff alive, you know. Anyway, then we we um, we moved to Dublin um, in 1969. Um, I went to Temple College. History was my favourite subject in school, you know. I, I managed to get an A actually, the leading cert, um, which was a big surprise. <laughs> um, I think another influence was my older brother Eugene, um, my late brother Eugene, with whom I was very close. Like he studied history in Trinity. So in the 70s then, as a teenager, I kind of hung around a, a bit in Trinity. I was the only supporter, actually, of the Trinity third soccer team. Eugene was the player manager, <laughs> but social secretary might be a, a better uh, description. And no one would say if anyone could end up playing for them. I remember John Robbie, you know, the, the later played rugby for Ireland. He, he played for Eugene's team one stage. Anyway, um, <clears throat> but I, I, didn't, I didn't go to college straight after, after um, uh, the Leaving Cert. I actually... Um, I, 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 I trained as a fitter turner in the ESB in Ringsend Power Station, so totally unconnected with history. Um, but that equipped me with the ability to make a living for myself. So with you know, being able to make a living for myself, make my own decisions, my first decision was to go back to college to study history, you know, which uh, like my father wasn't totally pleased with that, you know. But anyway, so I, I, I ended up doing, doing a, a history in Trinity in, in the 1980s, you know. But I, I'm glad actually I didn't, I didn't, go to college straight after the leaving start because my time in Ring's End, right, just gives you experience of life, you know, and there were some tremendous characters uh, who, who worked there, you know, many of whom went on to become, you know, successful uh, writers, artists, and so on, you know. But I think I, I, I kind of came to history then from a, a different angle, from a, a kind of politically, a political activist angle, you know, because, you know, you had the, you had the, the, the hunger strikes in the early 1980s, and that really was, you know, that, that was, you know, a, 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 a light switch moment for me, I have to say, you know, um, as well as that, I got involved in student politics. I was um, president of Student Union in Bolton Street, for example. And I think, again, when you come to history, when you're involved in actually trying to organize things yourself, you know, you have a much better understanding or empathy with the difficulties faced by people in history, you know. Um, so, it, it, and, and this came up, by the way, recently in the uh, head school we did at the Electric Picnic with Margaret Ward, you know, was the, is the, well, practice it's the 40th anniversary of the publication of her book, Unmanageable Revolutionaries. And she was very clear, she, she came to history as an activist, you know, as a feminist activist, you know. Um, whereas you get the view that, you know, that that sort of thing is, you know, that that's not the way historians should be, there should be these kind of completely, you know, you know, come out of a fridge like some sort of a, an academic fridge as a, as a you know, totally cold objective uh, observer. So anyway, I went to Trinity and um, ended up then doing a, a research on the United Irishman, which is a great subject, you know, uh, because it, it, it there was a huge proliferation of, of research and interest in that subject at that time. 
and then that had a public interest, uh, a, a, a public history um, uh, aspect to it because it coming up to the, the, the bicentenary of 98, mm -hmm. you know, the, in the 1990s, you know. And of course it had a resonance then with the whole peace process and so on, you know, maybe overstated by some politicians, I'll be honest with you, but I mean, I, I remember doing talks, you know, all over the country, right, but including in Northern Ireland, like right? including in, you know, mixed company, you know, and it's just, it's just brilliant, you know, just to get that feedback and so on, you know. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's where my interest in history, that's where it came from. Well, that, that area of research for you, 70 and 98, and you actually pop up in one of the earliest History Irelands, I think issue two, uh, as a contributor, uh, writing about Whitelaw's survey, which for anyone who doesn't know, was this incredible census of the city that was taken in a, a moment of real panic right, immediately after the 1798 rebellion. So, so what drew you, I suppose, to that period to the, to the United Irish story uh, was that kind of political radicalism, was it? Because Jim Smith's book, for example, comes out around that time too. Uh, it seems that there was there were reasons people were, were drawn to that story. Well, I think, you see, I, I think it, 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 it was all through the prism of, of the conflict in the North, you know, because the point is you, you had a, a, a deeply divided society. Yet back in the 1790s, you, you had, you know, the, the ancestors of people who today claim to be British were in the forefront of revolution, you know. And like, that, by the way, that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that, that if, if we study that period, it'll all be grand now, you know, let, let, let's not be simplistic about this. But the point is, it just nevertheless raises the question, how could that be? How could that have happened, right? But in relation to Dublin, Dublin is different now. It's, it, it, the United Irish from Dublin is slightly different, right? But what also attracted it to me was the fact that I lived in the city. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So looking at that, um, you mentioned that article on, on White Claw Census, you know, you can actually walk the, those laneways and streets that he mentions, you know? So, uh, but, but basically what White Claw did was he took advantage of the fact that uh, a government pop, a proclamation demanded that people put up a list of all the inhabitants, inhabitants of a house on the front door for security reasons. And uh, White Claw just said, well, if I just thought up all the names, I get a, an accurate uh, figure for the population of Dublin. But of course, what he didn't take, what he didn't realize was that in the poorer parts of the city where you had illiteracy and so on, you know, you get scrawled out names. And talk, so he had to go in and ask people. And then he was such a meticulous person that he, he did it, he had a whole team of people and he had to do, do it once, twice, three times. He must have been a hard man to work for, you know. But then the things he describes, you know, putrid blood bursting out of doors, like, and, you know, odour, you know, that's a, you know, a, 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 <laughs> As, as I said, a, a fancy word for, you know, shite, basically, piling up up to the first floor. Anyway, you, you know, it's pretty uh, stomach churning stuff, but I still use it with students, you know, get them to, to read bits of it, you know, and it's, uh, it's great, great. Unfortunately, the, the entire thing was, uh, the, the complete survey was destroyed in, in the yes. public record office in 1922. So we only have a, a summary of it, but it's, it's an absolutely fantastic source, you know. And it's one of the very, as we said, one of the very first subjects of the magazine. So we arrive in 1993. Uh, there is a magazine on the shelves. And the very first editorial says, the object of this magazine is to bring Irish history out of the ivory tower and to make the latest research accessible to the widest possible audience. At the same time, History Ireland will provide a forum for the local historian. Our contributors appreciate the need for clarity and their efforts are accompanied by illustrations, <clears throat> maps and pictures. We intend to encompass all schools of thought in a lively polemical magazine, which does not eschew controversy. So there's a very clear purpose, right, in that editorial. Uh, what I imagine. Well, by the way, though, it was Hiram Morgan, my my co-editor at the time. He wrote that. By the way, he wrote it and I edited it. You know, but it, it's it's very much Hiram. So no, the, the the genesis of this. Now I I can't claim to to be the originator of the idea. It it was you know several people simultaneously, if you like. Um. It was actually Hiram who first broached the idea of having a popular history magazine. And what provoked him actually was Brian Friel's Making History. So we can blame Brian Friel for this. And of course, Friel has written some brilliant plays, like translations in particular. Making History is about Hugh O'Neill. Mm. Uh, but Hiram takes issue with some of the factual inaccuracies. I mean, it's inevitable in a, in a, in a, in a work of art, like a piece of theatre, you know. Um, but at the same time, he also was full of praise for Friel for the imagination involved. And Hiram then finished up by saying, well, what this demonstrates is the need for a popular magazine. Do you know what I mean? In other words, he's saying you can't blame Friel for occupying that, that, that space between academic history and the general audience. Like historians can't whinge about it if they don't get in there themselves, you know? So he hawked the idea around, but he got no, nobody, nobody nibbled the bait. 
Now, it, it just so happened then I ended up in the Institute for Irish Studies in Belfast in, in 1991-92. And I, I was doing a research project on, on Belfast history, you know, uh, but it, it was an interdisciplinary institution and many of it in, in the back bar of Lavery's Gin Palace, I have to say as well, you know, so there's like the social aspect to it too. And you had, um, there was a fantastic collection of people there, right? you know, Peter Collins, uh, Tony Canavan, you know, uh, um, uh, Peter Gray, you know, the whole of people who were done pick up, become very prominent historians. Anyway, at the same time in Dublin, um, because of my, my political involvement, uh, I was involved with a guy called Rod Eagle, who ran a small kind of a left-wing printing, you know, co-op, you know. But Rod realised that there was no future in printing, you know, and that's certainly been borne out. Mm. Uh, so he wanted a publishing uh, project. So then all the discussion, we decided, well, what about, what about a history magazine, you know? So basically, we all got together and Rod kind of said, look at you guys, you produce the copy, I'll produce the magazine. And none of us had one clue, like, <laughs> I was involved in publishing. And uh, various people, including Kevin Whelan, by the way, who must get a mention. I mean, this is a pre-digital days, right? I mean, right. what we did was we drew up a list of all our contacts. Now, we're talking about hard copy, names, addresses, phone numbers, right? And we eventually came up with about 10,000 names, which is quite an achievement, right? on paper. Right, and we ma we we mail shot of them a facsimile of a magazine that did not yet exist, <laughs> asking them to fork out you know I think it was twelve quid a time for a one year subscription, and we didn't even have the first issue together. So this was akin to Michael Collins raising you know bonds for <laughs> the Irish Republic, which didn't yet exist you know back in nineteen twenty you know uh, you know, selling them over in America or whatever. And lo and behold, about a thousand people signed up. Wow. So that gave us enough money for the, 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 to, to print the first magazine. And uh, I have a copy of it here, actually. This is a, this is a collector's Which item. Which is rare as hen's teeth. There's the first issue of History Ireland. Wow. And funny thing is, I can remember almost every single article of it, it that's in it. If you'd asked me what was in the last issue of History Ireland, I'd be hard pressed to tell you, you know. That's what old age does, the memory. So, um, and then we, it just rolled along. We got, a, uh, we got enough revenue then to print a sec next one and the next one next one now as a business plan of course i wouldn't recommend it right so it just kind of rolled along you know mm. from, from from one issue to the other but the point was it's very clear from the get-go that there was a huge you know demand there was a need for this uh, magazine you know and that was reflected in the sales so that same editorial that says this magazine is being established without any grants from government public institutions or private benefactors and we've just heard how it actually came about uh, if people are wondering what's in that first edition of history ireland uh, an interview with Brendan Bradshaw, we'll touch on that in a minute, Kevin Whelan uh, on the geography of hurling, you know, something that's very in fashion now, that kind of approach to, to sports history, uh, Maria Luddy on Women and the Contagious Diseases Act, uh, Cormac O'Grada on the Great Hunger, Thomas Bartlett on 18th century Ireland. These are very, very significant names, you know, in the field of history uh, now, but there were also quite established names even then in many cases. Uh, was it difficult to convince academia of the merits of this endeavour or did they see this as a chance to connect with a new audience? Not at all. And this is the, the, the great thing, right? Um, straight away, academia, uh, right, right across the board, you know, um, um, backed this thing completely. Now, not, you know, not necessarily financially, but they all you know, gave their name. So, like, we had a list of patrons then, the first issue, you know, uh, Louis Cullen, uh, Roy Foster, you know, and, and others. I mean, the, the great and the good um, of, of history at that time. Um, so that was, I mean, for, for, for such a fractious bunch of people, right? I mean, this is the height of the whole revisions debate, you know, where people are tearing strips off each other. Everybody unanimously um, was, was in support of this project, you know? Um, and I have to say, like, I, I think that the whole kind of revisionist debate is very much part of the context of this, you know? Um, and you know, I, I would regard myself as you know in the anti-revisionist camp myself. However, we made the decision at the outset that this would not be an anti-revisionist uh, magazine because it might last one or two issues, but it would just disappear right from the start. As the that um, editorial says, we, uh, uh, deliberately we, we we wanted this to be a, a broad a broad church for 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 all points of view, you know. See, one of, the, one, of the, one of the downsides of, of the whole revisionist thing, and, and, and there's no doubt it was... It was um, but for anyone who doesn't know, Tommy, Brendan Bradshaw was one of the main... Yeah, he, he had, he, yeah, amongst the uh, uh, academics, you know, he had, 
you know, written a very famous article in, in Irish historical studies, you know. So I, I interviewed him in, in, in the first issue, you know. But one of the downsides of, of like there's no doubt there was a very, very strong revisionist tendency in, 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 the, in the history departments, right? But one of the downsides of that was it led to a kind of counter anti-intellectualism. Because some people were, 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 were you know, upset at what was being written, rightly so, but their response was to damn all academic historians, you follow mm. me, you know? So I think that uh, I felt from the outset that, and Hiram as well, you know, that we had to create this space so that, you know, to, to educate the public, you know, uh, in general, and not, not in some patronizing way, right? Mm. Um, and, and of course, if you look at developments in the meantime, in terms of uh, di digital media and so on, a democratization has taken place anyway, mm. as, you know, quite apart from History Ireland, that everybody can do research now. Everybody now can access, you know, the, the Bureau of Military History or the, the military pension files or whatever. Uh, so, but the, but the, but the, the approach the methodology laid down by, you know, Moody and so on way back in the thirties, that's now, that's now been taken up by everybody, regardless of their political, their political views. And that makes things very interesting. Bradshaw uh, ended that interview on a firstly positive note, and it's worth reading this in a festival of history. Uh, you, you asked him how he felt about the state of history in Ireland and Ireland's Irish people's interest in it. And he said, it seems to me that the Irish people are historically conscious and that that consciousness has not been lost. Everything that has happened has indicated that we will still have a strong sense of a past uh, going forward and that we see that the past is vital to the way we orientate ourselves towards the future. So I do not think we will become a rootless society. I think we're always going to want and to need historians. Just the kind of thing you want to hear from an interviewee in the first edition of a history magazine, isn't it? Well, it's, 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 it, that's written, you know, 30 years ago, right? And I think um, if you look at the situation, it, 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 what he says is borne out. And I think that the, you know, the, the go, going back to the whole digital thing and online stuff. Now, of course, this, 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 this is a double-edged sword. There's a lot of rubbish out there, right? Uh, conspiratorial right-wing nonsense, right? But there's some excellent websites out there. I mean, your own one, Dono. Um, also, John Dorney's The Irish Story. I mean, absolutely, really high-class stuff, you know, that mm. has a huge readership now, you know. And if you go, if you go on the, 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 the on Spotify podcast, I mean, there's, there's you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty um, competitive market out there, as you know, mm. Donald, right, it, it, amongst the history podcasts, you know. So at the beginning, you want the magazine to appear, it's important that it's academically strong. So you get that great involvement from academia from the start. But one of the great things about History Ireland, I think, has been it engaged with another but equally important species, which is the local historian. And I'm curious, in a time before the internet, in any meaningful way, uh, was it long before those contributions began arriving from you know outside, uh, outside the so-called ivory tower that Hiram Morgan spoke of in that editorial? Um, no, no, I'll be right from the start, Donald. Like, like, like the, the, only, the only prerequisite I had for, for, for content for History Ireland was that it wasn't boring. <laughs> no, really, you know, no, I mean, that's, that might sound, you know, a bit glib, but like, that's the, you know, if, if it's interesting, copy, you know, the other thing is that like each, each issue has a certain mixture, right? So I always like to have a mixture of, you know, a heavyweight might be too strong a word, but you know, something that's new, cutting edge academic stuff, right? But mixed in with, with some, some more general articles, you know, so sometimes you, you might, I might publish an article, which, which to the academic mightn't seem to be cutting edge or new, but it doesn't matter if it's well written and it summarizes some uh, aspect of history that people are interested in, I'd publish it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and th that was the case, you know, right, right from the start, you know? I think it's important to make this point because someone might be listening to this thinking, oh, you know, uh, you establish a magazine and it's an upward only trajectory, up it goes. But the magazine did hit a, a major wall. And I suppose we could perhaps divide the history of History Ireland. Uh, into before and after Wordwell. Is that, is that fair to say what began yeah, well, uh, that relationship? Yeah, no, we ran for about 10 years, but just as I said, it was by the seat of its pants, you know, it, it didn't have any, uh, you know, you know, it wasn't, you know, there was no capital raised or whatever, you know, and it's like in any business, uh, the, the weaknesses appear when you try to expand, you know, like uh, for, for first thing to say is history would not have been set up without Rod Ely, mm. absolutely crucial to the whole thing, you know, I mean, Rod was visionary enough and mad enough, you might say, to, to set it up. Like no, nobody else would have taken it on, you know. But then he, he, he um, we, you know, we well mainly kind of he 
uh, trying to set up a, a Scottish magazine, right? And <clears throat> that's when the weakness is then the, in, at the business side began to appear. So the result was, you know, without going into the detail of it, like that there was a there was a there was a falling out. Now the good thing is that History Scotland continued with with Rod and uh, his his partner Joy Harden, who by the way did the design. This is something I want to say just you know before I forget. Like I mean, we've been extremely lucky in History Island with the quality of the designers mm. initially, Joy Arden, and uh, for the last number of years, like we've had uh, Gerard Garland, um, who's really you know one of the best designers we've had, I have to say, and a lot of people listening will be familiar with her work actually because she, she also designs uh, a, a lot of stamps, you know, so you've probably seen her work without realizing it's hers, you know. Anyway, the thing is, they went off and continued History of Scotland. They, they've since retired, by the way. History of Scotland is still going, which is great. Wow. Um, and then it looked like the whole thing was finished. Uh, and then Nick Maxwell came along Wordwell and rescued the whole operation, you know. But the thing about Nick is that Nick brought a whole kind of professionalism to it. He knew the business. And I think also the trends in publishing were heading, were, were, were going in, 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 in our favor in the sense that the, the costs of production were going down, uh, the, the cost of the quality. For example, in, in the early days, we couldn't have more than eight pages of color, you know, so it was like twisting the bloody Ruby cube, trying to, you know, get the color to hit the, the, the maximum number of pages, you know. Uh, I mean, you, you know, I wouldn't think about this now at all, you know. Uh, so we went full color. We went from four times a year to six times a year. And, you know, the, the, the whole operation was, was kind of professionalized, you know, and, and by the way, at this stage, I, I also have to mention all our backroom people, Una McConville, you know, Helen Dunn, you know, there's a whole administrative side to History Ireland, you know, beneath the water, if you like, mm. that, that makes the whole thing function, you know. And so, Nick, he, of course, he, so he rescued it and it then went from strength to strength, you know. An archaeologist, Nick, who'd been there at, at, at Wood Quay and had published on that, but I suppose History Ireland is part of that bigger Wordwell family now, together with with Archaeology Ireland, it's 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 a it's a broader kind of output of putting these subjects into the mainstream for Nick. Yeah, and, and also he 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 uh, he publishes like history and archaeology, you know, as well, you know. Uh, so it, it it was an economy of scale there. You see that that uh, it was very difficult for history Ireland to sustain it, sustain itself as a standalone production, you know. And there are certain moments I think when we think of history in Ireland. Uh, that, that come to mind, I suppose, where the magazine finds itself propelled into a broader mainstream discussion. Uh, I'm thinking about November, uh, December 2012. A letter appears from a reader, Peter Connolly, and I, I love this letter. It's worth reading. Sir, I see that the last issue of History Ireland has two more letters on the subject of the Kilmichael ambush and two more in this issue. I wonder whether, I, I, that's your note, I wonder whether any other subject has occupied more space in the letters pages over the years. Surely the issue of the false surrender can be laid to rest. I appreciate that it is not the facts of the event, but the ideological differences between adherents of the differing interpretations that lie behind the bitter arguments. That issue ran and ran, and Kilmichael really seemed to propel History Ireland into much broader focus. I mean, there's newspaper articles in The Independent, The Irish Times, about History Ireland. It's discussed on the radio. Is it fair to describe the Kilmichael ambush debate uh, the question over whether it was a, a, a surrender or false surrender at Kilmichael uh, is a defining moment in the history of the magazine. And how did it feel to try and stir that ship? Um, well, I was only responding to, 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 to the debate that was out there. Do you know what I mean? So I was only yeah. doing my job of, of um, giving space to, to the debate, you know. But when you say, like, did, did, did Kilmichael raise up history? Added, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Charlemagne raised up the volunteers and some of your sons, the volunteers raised up Charlemagne, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's 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 a what's the word I'm looking for? It's a symbi symbiotic relationship. The point is that by 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 the time the uh, the Kilmichael controversy was raging, you know, it was online anyway. You know, regardless mm. of, of 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 History Ireland, you know. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that issue will ever be resolved. You know, I mean, I, I think it's it's run its course. I mean, obviously there was a, there, there was, we we had a review of um, Eve Morrison's recent book, and that provoked you know a, a, a response. But I noticed that there's been no there's been no follow up to it. So my, my sense is, you know, the public have, have had enough of that. You know, I mean, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure how relevant it is. I mean, the point is, if you have a this is one of the, the most ruthless, vicious um, engagements of the War of Independence, right? Because um, this again, this came up in relation to the, the, the shooting of Michael Collins right at our recent uh, electric picnic high school, um, you know, Brian Hanley made the point that in a military engagement, 
I mean, you know, who can, you know, even people are there. How yes. can they reconstruct an accurate depiction when they're in fear of their lives, you know, when bullets are flying all over the place? So like, I, 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 I think that we'll never know. The only thing we do know from all of the, from, from, from uh, the controversy is what a, you know, a vicious um, encounter that was. And that's what war is like. Mm. And the idea that, that our war of independence was some boy's own, you know, cowboys and Indians type thing, it doesn't, it's just not credible, you know? So I, I, I don't think, I don't think, by the way, it, it lessens uh, Tom Barry's, you know, role as, as a great freedom fighter, personally, mm. for me politically, as, as an Irish citizen. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to people like Tom Barry who achieved the freedom we now exercise, you know? So, but that doesn't mean he's an altar boy, you know? Mm. And I, I listened to an interview you gave with a, a Belfast-based television programme, History Now, and you made the point to Barry there that <coughs> you can never know exactly what happened in the past. I think that's so important. You know, we never know no, exactly. No, because you see, you see... The, 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 we're the, standing the, there watching it. You know, the difficulty with, with Kilmichael is a lot of the controversy rages around um, uh, oral testimony. Do you know what I mean? Um, um, interviews done years later with people. And of course, you know, the question of whether they were alive or dead at the time, right? But I'll, I'll move on from that one, right? But, you know, apart from that, the point is like that, that as soon as the word leaves somebody's mouth, they're contaminated. Mm. You know, I mean, like it, it, there's nothing sacred about a, an oral testimony. I mean, they're useful, right? Yes. Um, but that we treat with extreme caution, you know? And in the and case the of your... Of, like, it's, like, it's like in a court of law, you know, that you're you're not allowed to 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 um to read from a memoir. Like if you go if you go if you if you read something out in court, right? It could only be from notes you made at that time, you know. Mm. So if you're at Ken Michael with the bullets flying over your head, you're taking notes like it's just impossible, <laughs> you know. But I, I, I think though, I mean, in terms of Peter Hart, though, right? I mean, there's more serious issues of Peter Hart. So quite apart from the the the, the question of the false surrender is his general depiction of the war as a sectarian so that's been that's been completely undermined you know mm. but it's been undermined by scholarship but that's that's the, that's the cut and thrust of scholarship you know and i think, think since that time there's been incredible work done on the ira on a local basis across the country you think about people like john borganovo um yeah. origogo rourke liz gillis in dublin that's that's something that began with fitzpatrick arguably in the work on claire but it's really expanded yeah. right across the island of ireland by the way, just mentioned David Fitzpatrick, right? Who died a few years ago, right? I mean, uh, he was a very regular contributor to, to history and one of my best, actually. I mean, he, 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 I mean, always got good copy from David, you know. And like he's, he was quite a curmudgeonly individual now, you know. Everyone would say, you know, he wasn't a very collegiate person, you know, he was a, lo he was a bit of a lone wolf, right? You know, but he always recognized the, 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 the platform that history and gave him. You know, mm. and uh, I, I had a very good relation with him over the years. I have to say, even though he's the only he's the only academic to ever to fail an essay of mine as an undergraduate, but we will we, not dwell <laughs> on that. Ultimately, uh, what makes a magazine so special, I think, is its physicality, and I hope we never see History Ireland entirely online. Though it is more online than ever, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Podcast. Oh, don't I? I totally yeah, agree with you. Like I have to say, call me old fashioned, but every time they, 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 I, I pick it up, you know, I. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, I'm the same. I smell it, you know. Um, I, I, you know, I go through every page. No, I mean the point is, I, I, I'm old enough to remember, you know, the smell of cow gum, you know. Yes. I mean, cow gum. That was when you used to lay out magazines and, and <clears throat> newspapers, like bits of paper and so on, you know. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm quite aware of the, 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 the physical sensation of the thing, you know. Physic physicality is everything in the, for a magazine, but in terms of covers, there have been some really special contributions. I'm thinking about. Uh, Sean Hillen, uh, who did a, a really wild cover, you might talk about, and also Bobby Bala, uh, amongst others. Uh, can you talk us through that process? I mean, pr probably the most important thing for an editor after good content is a good cover. I mean, that's what will convince the plain people of Ireland to pick it up or leave it on the shelves, isn't it? Well, I, I wish I could say to Don that this is a, it's a very coherent and uh, systematic process, right? But it, 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 I mean, it, it often isn't um, because, you know, my, my publisher, Nick Maxwell, you know, I, I, I've driven him to distraction sometimes trying to pick a, a decent cover. It's a, just a chancy business, you know, because it's, you're not producing like a fashion magazine where mm. you can determine, you know, some nice glossy cover, precisely what you're going to put on it, you know. Um, 
you're dealing with, and, and, and this is something I just picked up over the years, like is the visual sense. And again, I, I, I just had to make this up as I went along, you know. I mean, you, 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 you get a sense where, obviously you've got the places like the, the National Gallery, National Library, they, and they, by the way, they've all upped the game in terms of their, 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 their production of, of good images. And, and by the way, when History Island started, I mean, the pot of images that people use was tiny. You see the same images, you know, recycled yeah. over and over again in books and so on, right? And again, this is not another um, aspect of the internet. It's just this been a complete explosion of availability of stuff. I mean, it's fantastic, you know. But so going back to the question of covers, right? Like, Michael Collins never did us any harm, right? But you can't put Michael Collins on the cover of every magazine. But also, God, I mean, I'd say that the sales just go up, you know. But that's the kind of that's the kind of a celeb thing almost, you know. Um, be very lucky with uh, Bobby Ballard. It just happens to be a neighbor of mine, you know. Like we we've sometimes used stuff that he he had already done, but like I commission stuff from Bobby, you know, and I'm sure I'm not paying him the the going rate for his services, you know. I mean, he did a, he did a fantastic one based on that. It's a famous picture of Ben and Behan with these weird kind of pointy sunglasses on, you know. And Bobby did a, 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 a his version of that, you know, which is one of our, you know, a good, lovely cover, you know. It's been he did, one, he did one as well of, of Parnell, you know, and it was like a, you know, the Movember, you know, the beard and all, right? And it, it just, it just transformed it like, you know, and it, this is, you know, what artists do, you know. By the way, Bobby has a, has, has a fantastic image of, um, John Charles McQuaid in the pipeline on the wraps um, we're, we're, we're going to use in, in next year sometime. It's, it's the 50 years since the, the death of John Charles McQuaid, you know, and uh, we got a whole issue and several head schools about him, but that's that's for next year. The the image of Behan that you're referencing is fantastic. Yeah, it's outside of court, of court, the president of the court, and he's at the height of his stardom and he's wearing these kind of novelty sunglasses. It's a fantastic image. Uh, but Sean Hillens, what we have to talk no, about. Sean that. Hillens, no, you see, I, I, I know Sean personally for years back, you know. And I remember Sean used to do his stuff like literally, like this is before the Photoshop, right? Sean literally had the scissors out and bits of paper, you know, you know, photo and, and cowgum, so. right? Um, and I remember his ones, his own London Newry, you know, or, you know, the Virgin Mary appears at the border, the security forces investigate, you know, he had a whole series <laughs> like this, you know. Yeah, but he did, he did, he did one for us. Um, it was, um, it was, you know, spring of 1916, you know, but it, it's, it's, you look at it and superficially it just looks like another image of the GPO, you know, but then the, the title of it is what's wrong with the post office. And you look at it closely and he's, he's photoshopped in the Garda riot squad. You know, they, they, they remember the orange order riot a few years back. So they are kind of down one end of the street. And then you have these kind of uh, shop window stuff in the windows of the, um, the GPO. You know, I mean, I'm not going to interpret this for people, right? Well, commercialization, I don't know, whatever. And meanwhile, there's flying saucers <laughs> in the sky. Anyway, so it's a completely bizarre, typical Sean Hill and eclectic melange, right? But it, it worked perfectly for, for you know, they were March, April, they were March, April 2016. I love his, yeah, Yuri, Yuri Gagarin over Newry and, uh, and the like, just really yeah. uh, fascinating artist. Uh, in terms of, Favorite articles. I was thinking, you know, what are some of the pieces I've really loved in, in History Island over the years? And one of them, though I know it didn't appear in in print, uh, it appeared online. I think it, it deserves its praise uh, in this discussion today. Uh, Counterfactual Parnell was written by Patrick. Yeah, what, what happened? Yeah, what happened there was uh, Patrick's name from the Dictionary yeah. of Irish Biographies, one of the great contributors uh, to it. This was a really, really playful piece. I noticed something about the footnotes when I read it. There was one from James Connolly. James Connolly files in the imperialist uh, flies in the imperialist parlor. Letters from Kilmainham, Glasgow, 1919. Connolly was three years dead. Yeah, but just go back down, just explain the, the, the genesis of that, right? The, 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 the Dan Mulhall, by the way, who's been writing for us for years back, right? It's before he became famous as our man in Washington, the, the, our, our ambassador in Washington. Um, he's been a regular contributor to, to history over the years. Dan Mulhall wrote a, a, a counterfactual on what happened if Parnell had lived into the 1920s, as did most of his contemporaries, right? And he, he, he wrote up, you know, an article, an interesting piece on that. And then um, Patrick Mom, and of course, Patrick, another regular contributor to History Ireland, right? And, and especially his uh, dictionary, dictionary, dictionary of Irish biography pieces, because before, before the DIB was published, they had this deal that they would put in these short pieces to, in, in the run-up. 
But of course, the thing, the, the publication kept getting being postponed, right? So we got years and years of this fantastic copy, which kept coming like on a conveyor belt. Most of it written by Patrick, right? Anyway, Patrick submitted then his own counterfactual. Unfortunately, it was too long for publication in the magazine, but it couldn't, this couldn't be edited. It had to be, you know, a, a, a single piece. So we put it up on the website. And Patrick's thesis was, well, actually, it was much more likely that Parnell would have died earlier because of health problems and so on. And then he wrote this counterfactual, right? But as you say, I began to notice, well, these footnotes are weird. And what it actually was is it was the footnotes for the books that would have been written had the counterfactual come to pass. So the one you're referencing there, James Connolly. So 1916 didn't happen. So now, you know, James Connolly was this failed revolutionary writing in 1919, you know, absolute work of genius. Unfortunately, though, we, we could only put it up on the website, but I see then a few years later, Paul Bew published it as an appendix at the back of one of his, his books, you know. But uh, he's a real treasure, Patrick, I have to say. Getting to the contemporary world, uh, the magazine was always going to be shaped by, and I think it's fair to say a shaper of uh, the decade of centenaries. And you played a big role in that, I mean, the History Island Hedge School. That was a really interesting idea. Uh, people might be surprised to hear where, where it launched and where the early editions happened. <clears throat> Well, okay, first of all, just by way of total disclosure, the first time I came across the like, high school, obviously, apart from the, the, the historical uh, context, um, I visited Milwaukee Irish Fest several times back in the 1990s. Uh, an absolutely amazing event, you know, biggest Irish music festival in the world, they would always remind me, but 120,000 people, you know. Now, it would be anything from kind of really cheesy, you know, Kiss Me on Irish stuff, to really high-end, you know, um, history lectures and so on. So they had a... They had a, what would now be called a spoken word area, but it was a little tent called the head school, and basically just for, for people who gave lectures, you know, uh, including myself, you know. Anyway, years later then, I got a gig with uh, standing in for Patrick Gagan on um, uh, News Talks, Talk on History. Now, the thing about that was that, uh, and Susan Cowell uh, was the producer, right? And uh, I have to say, I owe a lot to Susan, right? Because you, you learn the discipline of, you've got an hour, of a discussion. You got maybe three or four people, some of whom are not even in the studio with you. Mm. You have to go to ads. So you have to hit all these 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 marks, right? So you have to this this just yet you have to you know put together you know very very quickly right a discussion that makes sense to the listeners. Now a few years after that then I myself and the kids we went to the electric picnic. I hadn't been to a festival for 20 years. I think Lister Varna 1982 is the last festival I was at. So I checked out their spoken word stuff. There's an area called the Minefield, run, still run by, by Nisha Nunn. And uh, David Mike Williams was doing this thing, you know, fantastic. I mean, he does a great job, you know, a political cabaret, you know, um, <clears throat> chairing a discussion, you know, in the middle of a rock festival, you know. <laughs> so I was thinking, hey, that's, that's, that's an idea, you know. So I, I, I contacted Nisha um, and then I pitched the idea of a history iron head school, kind of round table discussion. And of course, Donald, you were in, the, in at the ground floor of this one. Very first one then, debuted at the Electric Picnic, 2010, uh, almost a disaster. Uh, I was supposed to have George Galloway on the panel who pulled, whose plane was delayed or something. Then another panelist who shall name nameless rings me up about an hour before I wish you'd start from central Dublin saying, where's the, where am I supposed to be? So I had to put him in a taxi, you know, and drive to Stradbally, you know. So that was my profit for the, for the weekend gone. Anyway, he arrived. And as soon as the show started, a bit late, it you know, was fantastic. And it packed every time, packed every year, and we've been doing it every year since, you know. So that was the first one. Following weekend then, we did one um, outside the library in, remember, in, in Fibsborough on, on, on the whole punk uh, uh, 1977, you know. And of course, I didn't realize that Fibsborough was a, a hotbed of, of <laughs> kind of punk rock, you know, at that stage. And we had all sorts of people. We had uh, Dave Donnelly, who was the leader of you know, the Black Catholics, that, you know, dodgy gang that existed at that time, you know, and, and uh, Pete Holiday of the Radiation Space, you know. Anyway, went from, we, we, we've had it in the National Library, we've had it Wheatfield Prison, we did one in, in, in jail yeah. once, that was a, an interesting one. But uh, the, the Electric Picnic, I mean, that's a, a primarily quite a young uh, demographic. Do you like the challenge of trying to bring history to an audience like that, which people may not envision? as an audience that's willing to listen. But over the years, I've been to most of them, the attendance has been very, very strong. Yeah, no, I mean, and this year it was the best ever, you know. Um, I say we, we had one discussion on looking at Margaret Ward's um, uh, unmanageable revolutionaries, you know. And um, 
I mean, you, you forget, like she was, she, she made the point, for example, that she didn't have any female lecturers, you know, she said, you can't be what you can't see, you know. Mm. And then the, the panel I had, uh, you, you had people, I mean, the youngest person on the panel was Shifra Aiken, you know, who just published that book on, on, on civil war memoirs, you know. Um, and of course she was born after, you know, years after um, Margaret had published that book, you know. Um, but the point was like, you just had women, young women in the audience, you know, whose uh, first port of call, like in terms of history was Margaret's book, you know. Mm. So I felt like, you know, the scene in, in, in um, Woody Allen's, you know, Annie Hall, like where, where he's, you know, he hears some guy bullshit in the, in the cinema queue before with Marshall McLuhan. And then Woody Allen says, actually, I have Marshall McLuhan standing here beside me. He says, you know nothing about my work, you know, that, you know, if only life was like that. You know, it, it was just great to introduce this, this person to, to, to this young audience, you know. And then the other, um, the other discussion then was a kind of contrafactual. What if, what if Michael Collins um, mm. hadn't been shot in the Civil War? You know, and that was a that was a lively discussion. You know, but I, I think it's it's the point is like that I can't do this without the scholarship of the people involved. Do you know what I mean? So my role is 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 to put on a show, if you like, and to assemble the different bits. And it's just based on my gut feeling. You know, your own limited knowledge. You know. And sometimes the more limited your knowledge, the better, because you're, you're in a better play, a better position to put yourself in the place of the audience. Do, do you follow me? Well, you've, and, you've been and, bringing this everywhere. You know, about you, you've brought it north. Uh, it's you, uh, a pop-up banner, and a, a, a Zoom microphone. But then during the the lockdown, I suppose I had to move to a very different kind of Zoom. That brought well, challenges, yeah. but also must have brought potential because you could you were no longer bound by geography. No, that's the thing you see, like uh, the, the, the History on Head School was, was always a live show. Now we used to record it, we never, we never pushed this podcast, you know, the, and it, it was never systematic, you know. So essentially it was a live show and I love that because I mean, I, I just get a buzz out of that. I mean, you know, you like yourself, don't I've been doing walking tours for years, you know, there's a certain buzz in talking to a live audience, you know, mm. um, even even just to feed your ego. Right? So in front of a live audience and then you get the, once, once it goes to the floor, you know, the whole thing can take off and any, direction you know anyway problem then with cold voice you couldn't do that you know so we moved on to zoom and uh, that was a challenge for us to get used to it. so that was almost like going back to the the news talk radio studio for me you know uh with the disembodied voice you know you know out in the ether but then of course you realize that you can you can broadcast from several continents you know which i did mm -hmm. i think my record was three you know somebody in, in new york somebody in melbourne and a couple of people in in, in ireland well wow, tricky then, by the time that works for everyone there yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that 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 presented certain challenges, you know. Uh, now then, we 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 operate with a, a, a crowd called Head Stuff. You know, they they edit the stuff and so on, and, and they you know given us various recommendations and tricks to improve the quality. So, so suddenly I, I kind of fell into the, the the podcast business, you know, like, like yourself, you know, and uh, we 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 put them up since twenty twenty, you know, systematically, and they're on Spotify and all the other platforms now. And I think we, we've now accumulated 160,000 listens. Wow. You know, that's in total now, right? Um, biggest one, of course, all Michael Collins, the one we did, um, not, not the electric picnic one, the one we did before that, about 5,000. You know, normally you'd get plateau wow. about 2,000. The electric picnic one is about 3,000. So that's about 9,000 heading towards 10,000 for those two Michael Collins podcasts together or combined, you know? Um, yeah, so, so that, that's opened up a whole new area. But I think what we'll do now is we, we'll combine a live show and record it, you know, so you'll, you'll end up with the best of both worlds, you know? So we'll mix them, you know? So um, we, we'll, be, we'll, we'll continue into, into next year. I think a, a good concluding question for this discussion, and it's a big question, of course, uh, is the decade itself. It is winding to an end, the decade of centenaries, but as you, as you say, does it really end? And it strikes me, or I see gays, if we might call it that, that will be the abiding memory, perhaps. Uh, it did impact on politics, the decade of centenaries in different ways. Uh, there seems to be an acceptance that that RIC gate may have shaped the election that followed in a small way. On the whole, do you think that the decade of centenaries, did it produce any great surprises to your mind or did it go as you expected it to? Well, you know, I, there, I think that there's no doubt there seemed to, in the early stages, there seemed to be a fear amongst the powers that be, whoever they are, right? Um, that you know, this is kind of too hot to handle. Right? But I, my 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 impression is that the, the horses weren't frightened. You know what I mean? Mm. That um, appropriate uh, commemorations took place, not just commemorations, but 
you know, lectures, people educated themselves. Um, there was, like I, I did several head schools kind of at, at a county level, you know, engaged with, with local libraries and so on, uh, including local historians, right? And the level of, the level of scholarship now is, is it's, it's professional, do you know what I mean? And it goes back to a point I made at the start, that there's been a, a, a complete democratization in terms of sources, right? So that came out well, I think, in the, in the, in the commemorations took place. So I, I, I have no complaints about it. I, th I think it was handled very well. But you see, the, 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 the enduring legacy, the one enduring thing about the, the revolutionary period, which is still with us, is partition. And I think that it's ironic that when we're coming to the end of this decade of centenaries, right, that all these issues are back, are still on the agenda, you know, back on the agenda because they never, they never left it. And I'd, I'd, I'd you know, I'd, I'd pull together that with Brexit, even the passing of Queen Elizabeth, God bless her, you know, if only because she was there for so long, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I regard myself as a political Republican, you know, but the point is she's been part of my, you know, my whole, you know, the wallpaper of my life, you know, and, um, I think that it, it's, it's certainly a change. It, it remains to be seen what's going to happen because she's like Queen Victoria, she's, she was there for so long that her very presence um, brought a certain stability to the whole British state. You, and and you, are in some ways, you are in some ways the voice of that royal visit. I remember on television. Oh yeah, I got two days work out of it. I wonder what that works out against her, you know. Um, <laughs> no, 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 but seriously though, I like, and, and I think that that visit was, was um, it was more an expression of our maturity as a nation or taking our place amongst the nations of, of the world you know um I, I i i i didn't i wouldn't have been amongst those people who opposed that visit i thought there was a very uh, narrow view because who, who who the neighboring island chooses as their head of state is their business and how they do it is their business but of course it's partly our business because of the the the, the partition and, you know and so forth and of course that, those recent census figures are seismic because the whole basis in which Northern Ireland was set up was as a, as a sectarian headcount. So in a sense, on into reverse. all of that opens up, the decade of centenaries may be ending, but you can see a clear course of History Ireland's place in new discussions going well, forward. Uh, yeah, no, I, I think one of the things about History Ireland is that it is a broad forum. And that is very rare these days, in the days of, you know, of online echo chambers where people just, you know, speak to the converted, you know, and have their own prejudices uh, reinforced by other people's prejudices. And the reason I can say that is from looking at the letters pages, and uh, including the next issue, by the way, just <laughs> when you see it, right, you know, I, I mean, and even uh, famously, one person objected to one of my editorials, and, you know, I think some Northern Unionists, you know, and, and said, you know, this is the second time, this is the second time I've stopped my subscription to history. <laughs> I'm thinking, brilliant, you know. So the guy kept coming back for more, you know. And <laughs> no, I, I, I've always been aware of this, that it has a broad readership. And I think in the period we were about to enter, because this thing is now up for discussion, um, it's the, 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 the means by which it will happen is laid out in the Good Friday Agreement. So this isn't pie in the sky stuff. This is this mm. is now in the realms of practical politics. But it's very, but you know, that, that there's, it's a tricky, tricky, still a bit of a minefield we have to negotiate to get from A to B. And I think the existence of um, a forum, a popular history magazine like History Ireland is absolutely vital uh, in that process. Now, so I, I, I may not be around to see the, the culmination of this, right? But the point is that the forum is there. Mm. Tommy, I'm gonna take one or two comments uh, at the end before we wrap up. Uh, Blahin asks, is there any chance of republishing the first History Ireland magazine as a special once-off for the 30th anniversary. I'm open to offers for this, which is my personal copy here. Um, that, that's an interesting question. I, I actually, um, like, by the way, so if some History Ireland articles have been published by pen and sword, by the way, collected together in, in various themes, right? So we have done that in a limited way, but yeah, um, I must run that one past my publisher, uh, Nick Maxwell. By the way, just to tell you, I don't have a full set of History Islands because of this, the, the, I, I, I had a fire in my office a number of years ago, you know, a long story. So I, I believe they're going for silly money out on eBay, people tell me. So if you've got a full set, you know, mind it well, you know. But that's a, that's a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, I must, uh, I must run that past Nick 
Paula there had some comments and questions. Two comments, I'll put, I'll put them together. Glad to see Sue, Sue Cahill got, get a mention. Great producer, inspirational. I very much agree. Yeah, someone who was so important in uh, getting history onto the airwaves. Uh, and on the subject of whether things should be in person or online, Paul makes the point, please keep hybrid, best of both worlds, and suits yeah, me, yeah. Uh, and COVID paranoia. I know that's true for a lot of people too who like to have uh, both options. Kieran Glennon, uh, are you ever tempted to go monthly or would that just not be commercially viable? My wife would leave me. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think, no, I think bi-monthly is just about, just about, you know, um, the point was, even when we were quartered, I, I still had difficulty meeting deadlines. <laughs> so, you know, I, I think a bi-monthly treadmill is, is, is sufficient. You know, it, do, it does create problems when writing my editorial, you know, because the last two general elections, I was caught in between, you know, having to anticipate, you know, anyway. Um, yeah, that's a problem, you know. Pose the, no, the I, I think bi-monthly is probably, is probably fine. The term revision, I suppose, is very ambiguous. Uh, could Tom explain the current meaning? Surely all history involves... Uh, revision. It's a good point, I suppose. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 that's what I call revision with small r. I'm talking about re revisionists with a big r. Penalty. I mean, I, I suppose what I'm thinking of is it's more the kind of his academic revisionism, which then enters into journalism, you know, and, and gets completely simplified, you know, into a, into just a, a partisan political argument. That's the type of, of revisionism I'm, I'm thinking of. So to give you the final words, Tommy, uh, what is in the next edition? I'm sure that's what people want to hear. There you go. Here's a, here's a sneak preview of the front page. Can you see that there? Which is Noel Brown and a police dog. Noel Brown. It's a famous image of Noel Brown being savaged by a Garda dog. And it was the time of the, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that'll be, you know, that's, that was October 1962. So we have an article by John Mulqueen on the, the Cuban uh, Missile Crisis. Uh, we have. Uh, oh yeah, we've got a. Uh, there's a big book, uh, Ireland and Argentina, by by uh, Derma Kyo, which Michael Kennedy has reviewed in our big book slot. Um, Angus Mitchell has a piece on uh, Erskine Childers, of course, the centenary of his execution. And uh, John Gibney um, has a piece. Uh, this is a spin-off from the documents on Irish foreign policy series. They've been providing great copy to me over the years. It was looking at Ireland and Biafra. Right. And again, I, I, I've always stuck in a few articles on, on Biafra because this was, you know, really front and centre of my childhood. It's one of these things people have forgotten about, mm. you know, how, how central the Irish involvement uh, was. Because I'm a Temple Law College boy, you know, many of my teachers um, have been missionaries in, in Biafra, you know. So anyway, that's that's the next issue. And um, um, but, but of course, I'm on I'm already on the issue after that. At this yeah. There's no, no rest. It must, be, History Ireland. it must be tough for an editor to, to produce an editorial that is both current and safe in two months' time. I, I, if you have any ideas there, don't know, yeah, <laughs> send me an email. So, friends, I want to thank everyone uh, who tuned in for this discussion today uh, and who, contrib who contributed questions and comments to it. Uh, next year, as we said, it's the 30th anniversary of History Ireland magazine, such an important uh, part of the story of public history. Uh, in this country. I hope you're all enjoying the Festival of History. There's still a full week of programming uh, online and offline ahead. But for now, I just want to thank Tommy Graham for his participation and all of you for tuning in. So thank Thanks, you all. Paul. Peace.